Hey friends, this is going to be a bit awkward because I'm going to be criticizing Psyman Dan. If you don't know who he is, which would be surprising since he runs a very popular YouTube channel, all you need to know is that we're on the same side in the evolution creation argument. He also debunks a lot of other silliness like flat earthers and moon landing deniers and so forth. His primary background is in astronomy. I follow his channel and like his work, and I have to respect his work ethic. Unlike me, he's got a regular schedule of posting videos, and he sticks to it. I saw a couple of outrageous errors in one of his recent videos, but don't let that damage his overall reputation. These errors are entirely in the field of evolutionary biology, well outside the scope of his expertise, and this is a common problem when dealing with creationists. They gish gallop all over the place, trampling all over every scientific discipline humanity has explored, and dealing with that is a struggle. I'm a biologist, and in every discussion I've had with the creationists, they desperately squirm to get the topic away from my field of knowledge to hit me with claims about geology, or physics, or astronomy, where I can only reply with general background information. I usually just cut them off and tell them to focus on something more relevant. Simon Dan can't easily do that when he's criticizing a creationist video, though, especially when it's one that claims to disprove of all of evolution and various other sciences in six minutes. If it's a video, you have to play the hand you're dealt. And I'm sorry, Simon Dan, you flopped a couple of times. The video he's addressing is by a guy calling himself Orthodox Kyle who is truly one of the most ignorant creationists I've ever encountered. Also extremely arrogant. He threw out so many stupidities and misunderstandings and lies that he's pretty much invulnerable against any point-by-point -point rebuttal, because it would take hours to smack down what he claims in ten seconds. But Simon Dan made a valiant effort. For example, Kyle raises the question, how did the first eye develop? Let's listen to that. For example, how did the first eye develop? They say, oh, this is easy. We've done this so many times. This is uh, probably what happened. Wait, what probably happened? Science about what actually happened. It's about what is empirically verifiable, what is observable, what is repeatable. Yet, you have to assume evolution to come up with this explanation about how the eye could have developed. I love how he pontificates and how science works, while showing some stock footage of someone pipetting colored fluids into a beaker with other flasks and cylinders and beakers full of brightly colored liquids nearby on a perfectly clean white desk. What a cliche! Also, he's completely off base on the philosophy of science. We don't deal with absolutes or certainty. That's more for theologians. So let's see how Simon Dan answers that Well, one. actually, the fossil record shows us quite clearly that the first eyes appeared around 540 million years ago with the trilobites. There's real, actual evidence. And then a few million years later, eyes were everywhere spurred on by the instinct to survive that clear advantage of vision that the trilobite predators had. Now, Darwin himself, of course, realised how absurd it seemed for eyes to evolve. But you can quite clearly see how with small, gradual steps. Light-sensitive cells, then light-sensitive cells all clustered together. Then having that collection of light-sensitive cells to form in a little depression, etc, etc, etc. Hmm. Okay. One thing I've noticed is that non-biologists always leap to the fossil record as an answer, which is fine. Fossils are cool and interesting and informative, but that's not how most biologists would think. For instance, when Darwin answered that same question, he focused on the evidence from extant species that show a range of intermediate forms, from the eye spot to the shallow depression to the functioning eye that Dan described. Eyes tend to be soft and gooey and don't fossilize well. But also, when I address that question, I tend to focus on the molecular evidence, 
which also better answers the specific question of how eyes first evolved. All animals share the same set of molecules that handle photoreception. There is an opsin, which contains a molecule that can absorb a photon and change its configuration. Animal opsins are over 600 million years old, and similar molecules are found in protists and bacteria. Then there are G proteins, which are basically shuttles and amplifiers that carry a signal from opsins to enzymes that modulate metabolic activity, like phospholipase C or phosphodiesterase. G proteins and enzymes are more or less universal in eukaryotes. This activity then triggers changes in the excitation of the cell membrane, transmitting an electrical current. So, yes, the evolution of photoreception is easy. It's all about connecting existing components in the cells to make them sensitive to light. I also have an edge on Simon Dan on this topic since evolution of sensory systems has long been an interest of mine and I teach the subject here at UMM. I just looked at the syllabus for my intro biology course and I spent six lectures on just the evolution of vision in eyes. If Kyle had asked me that question, I could have bludgeoned him into a bored stupor with hours worth of explanation. Unfortunately, Kyle just barrels ahead, compounding his stupidities. Even if you grant them that somehow an eye could develop, how do you get two eyes that are nearly identical? I mean, the mathematical improbability of this, but then to get it twice? This is so ridiculous. Oh, that, that's like Ray Comfort levels of inanity. Uh, comfort is often playing this game. If there are two of anything, whether it's eyes or sexes, he assumes they must have evolved independently which is simply not the case. All the genes for eye development are present in every single cell in your body. They're simply only locally activated in small regions, like here and here, right? I'm afraid Simon Dan stumbles a bit here. Well, there was only one eye to begin with, but then the vertebrates came along and seemed to have success with the bifurcation of the nervous system. Now, this meant that the two sides of the body could be controlled independently. After that, it was only a matter of time before two eyes were better than one. It helps with width of view and depth perception, two massive advantages if you're hunting prey or trying to avoid capture. <sighs> okay. His initial premise is wrong. There wasn't one eye to begin with. Animal eyes evolved in bilaterians, organisms that exhibit bilateral symmetry. The left and right sides are mirror images of each other, and that's why we have two eyes. Or in the case of animals like spiders, eight eyes, four on each side of the midline. The animal nervous system has always been bilaterally symmetric. All that stuff about depth perception was a later adaptation that took advantage of the fact that we had paired eyes from the very beginning. We don't have two eyes for depth perception. We have depth perception as an adaptation derived from the fact that we have two eyes. Oops. Uh, that was an embarrassing error, especially after trying to answer the question how we evolved eyes by pointing at a trilobite fossil which had paired eyes. I'm sorry to say that it's about to get worse. Kyle is going to babble about junk DNA. They can't answer any of that. They can't answer junk DNA. And the more and more questions you ask them, you're going to realize how committed they are to evolution of the gaps. What do you mean we can't answer junk DNA? Okay, that's the right start. Junk DNA is not a question or problem. It's a fact. Much of our genome doesn't serve any kind of functional purpose. Evolution is a process of trial and error, and we've accumulated a lot of unnecessary scraps and mistakes in our genome. It's just there, not usually doing any harm, and definitely not a problem for evolutionary theory. Unfortunately, Simon Dan launches into a parade of errors from this point on. 
Junk DNA or non-coding DNA isn't really an issue. We've recently discovered that this junk DNA actually does do something. In fact, over 30 scientific papers now show that it's vital for gene controlling activities. But before we knew that, it was a major problem for the creationists. I mean, why would you create something okay. with junk DNA? Oh man, oh man, uh, first problem. Uh, junk DNA is not a synonym for non-coding DNA. He, he's got that completely wrong. Uh, second problem. No, we have not discovered that dunk, junk DNA actually does something. Junk DNA, by definition, doesn't contribute to the function of the cell. Third, there, there are papers that demonstrate that some stretches of DNA previously labeled as junk have acquired some functionality. These are scattered, isolated examples representing a minute fraction of the genome. They do not show that all DNA classified as junk has a function. So they don't answer the, the problem, supposed problem, being brought up here. Fourth, and the biggest error to me, regions of DNA responsible for gene controlling activity are not and never have been classified as junk DNA. Never ever. I'm a developmental biologist. I'm ac acutely interested in gene regulation. A reductionist might even argue that developmental biology is all about nothing but gene regulation. That's not true, but okay. There are a lot more than 30 papers discussing gene regulation, and promoters and enhancers and silencers have not ever been categorized as junk. I'm sorry, Simon Dan, that was such a bad answer that you get one of these. That being said, though, Simon Dan is one of the good guys. He's just not a biologist, and there's no crime in that. I'm not an astronomer, and I don't think I'm obligated to learn a bunch of space stuff to do my job, or to provide entertainment on YouTube. This is precisely why no one is ever going to debunk all of evolution in six minutes, as Kyle claims to have done, because science is so immensely complex and diverse that no one person can master it at all. At least we can all agree that Kyle is an ignorant clown. It's obvious that these were answers Simon and Dan gave on the fly and should have been vetted by friends who are more knowledgeable about biology. I'd be happy to review any similar answers in the future. My email is down below. And I'd also urge my followers to subscribe to Simon and Dan's channel. He's usually spot on. And obviously, as a scientist, he'd accept criticisms without a problem. With that, I hope a few of Simon Dan fans would still be willing to like and subscribe here. I'm not going to routinely nitpick over his videos like this. And hello to my wonderful patrons who've been supporting me with little reward, I'm sorry to say. Uh, my Patreon account at patreon.com slash pzmyers is keeping our blog network, freethoughtblogs.com, afloat. And has also been funding my research on spider development and behavior. Thanks very much to all of you. I wonder how many other things Kyle gets totally, stupidly wrong. They have their dogmas, and Darwinism is their grandest of grand do dogmas.